All right. Good afternoon. Oh, sorry. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome back. So today, let's continue what we started uh, on chapter number seven. And let's see how far uh, we can get uh, into uh, the chapter, chapter number uh, seven. Okay, so let's see here where we stopped. Share my screen with you. Okay, so this was the last thing I showed you. So we are now focusing on waves. I showed you that there are two different uh, kinds or types of, of wave, mechanical waves and electromagnetic waves. So light is an electromagnetic wave and we will focus on that uh, from now on. And I showed you that there is an equation that correlates the speed of a wave with the wavelength and the frequency. And we did some simple calculations here for uh, red light and violet light or purple light. Okay, so we got here uh, the frequency for red light and the frequency for purple light using uh, V equals to lambda times uh, nu. So now let's try to figure out what's the correlation between the frequency of a wave and the energy uh, of this wave, okay? the energy that the wave uh, carries. So the last question I asked you was about uh, what do you think about the energy of the violet compared uh, to the energy of the red? So the trick here is to look at what it's immediately below uh, the violet. So we have UV and what's immediately above the red, which is infrared. So we know that the UV light uh, is more damaging. So therefore, for some reason has more energy. So now today, let's investigate uh, if we can get a number for the energy associated with uh, each wave, okay? So then let's move on to the Planck theory. The energy is absorbed or emitted in discrete packs. And these packs are called quantum that are always a, a multiple of a number, okay? So what the Planck theory tells us is that the energy emitted or absorbed by a, a body or a source travels in small packs of energy. And we are going to call these small packs quantum or photons. The Planck's equation is the equation that correlates the energy that a wave transports with its frequency or with its uh, wavelength. So that here is uh, Planck's equation. So let's analyze what each term of the equation uh, represents. So here we have, oops, E. e stands for energy. Hmm. So my pen is not working for some reason. Oh, boomer. Okay, so E stands for energy. And the unit of energy that we are going to use is joules. Age in the equation is the Planck's constant. So that's always going to be 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. And the unit that we are going to use is joules per second. Sorry, joules times second. And nu is the frequency of the wave in hertz. <clears throat> 
So that's a way to calculate the energy if we know uh, the frequency, okay? Age times the frequency. However, we can rearrange the equation. Rearranging the equation, we know that speed is equals to lambda times mu. Therefore, we are going to replace the frequency by speed over lambda, okay? And the speed of light, I'm representing here by uh, C. So just give me a minute here. Let me see what's going on here. Just a second. Okay, so I, okay, now it's working here. Okay, so again here, this is the Planck's equation. And that's the equation that correlates energy with the frequency of a wave. So let's go back here for each term of the equation. E represents the energy of the wave and the unit in the international system is uh, joules. The next term in the equation is H, which is the Planck's constant. And that's going to be always 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times second, okay? And the last term in the equation, that's the frequency of the wave. And remember here, the unit is heart. Oh, sorry, hertz, okay? Hertz is the same thing as uh, seconds to the minus one. So that's one way uh, to calculate the energy of any kind of electromagnetic wave. So we can rearrange this equation uh, to use the speed of the wave and the wavelength. So let me go here to the corner, right here. So we know that the speed of the wave is equals to the wavelength times the frequency. In the case of the electromagnetic waves, the speed is the speed of light. So I'm going to replace V by C equals to lambda times mu. Therefore, the frequency of the wave is going to be C over lambda. So what we are going to do is to replace the frequency in the original Planck's equation by C over lambda. Replacing the frequency right here in the first equation, we are going to end up that energy is equals to Planck's constant times C which is the speed of the light over lambda, okay? So both ways are ways to calculate the energy 
doesn't matter which one you use, you're going to use the one that's more convenient. Okay, so two ways to calculate the energy. So let's note here in the second equation, C is the speed of light. And that's three times 10 to the eight meters per second in the air or in the vacuum. And lambda is the wavelength in the international system that's in meters. So those are the two ways to calculate the energy that a wave, a wave transports using the Planck equation either using just the frequency of the light or a combination of the speed of the light over the wavelength. Okay, so now that we know about Planck's equation and we can correlate uh, energy with the frequency, so we have here E equals to H times mu. If the frequency increases, that will reflect in an increase of the energy. And that's how we can compare the energy of different uh, parts of the visible spectrum or the whole electromagnetic spectrum. So if you take a look here in the figure that I'm showing you, so we have here uh, energy and the wavelength. So the correlation between energy and the wavelength is inversely proportional. An increase of the wavelength will decrease the energy. See here that X-rays, gamma rays, and UV rays, they have a uh, low wavelength compared uh, with IR, radar, radar, FM, or short wave, uh, uh, short wave uh, waves. Therefore, the purple part of the electron, the visible spectrum has higher energy when compared with the red part of the electromagnetic spectrum, okay? So moving from violet to red, we are going to decrease the energy that these waves is transporting. And that's why UV rays are damaging to the skin and IR rays are not, okay? It's a matter of how much energy is being transported.
Okay, so where are we uh, now? So now we know that uh, electromagnetic waves, they have a specific wavelength and frequency associated to them that depends where they are in the uh, spectrum and the energy of each part of the electromagnetic spectrum will be different and depends on the frequency and the wavelength okay so to calculate the energy we can always use the Planck's equation e equals to h times nu therefore low frequency waves have low energy and high frequency waves have high energy so we must be able to correlate the frequency of a wave with the energy now let's look at the very tiny part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can see so the visible spectrum the visible spectrum starts with the violet short wavelengths therefore high energy and goes all the way up to the red okay red is longer wavelength therefore low sorry high wavelength therefore low energy okay so the energy will decrease along the visible spectrum okay so now let's go back to the other screen okay so now that we have the knowledge that waves transport energy so we are ready to uh, analyze the Bohr atomic model so let's bring back the atomic models the last atomic model that we talked about was uh, the Rutherford the Rutherford atomic model was uh, based on a very dense and positively charged nucleus that's concentrated in a very small volume and the electrons were moving around the nucleus okay so the rutherford model uh, is very important to uh, start talking about a nucleus and electrons moving around it so very useful however uh, if you remember, Ben, you uh, had a problem with the Rutherford model because a negative charge uh, moving around a positive charge, they, that will have attraction, and eventually the negative charge will fall into the nucleus, okay? And that would be a collapse of the system. So that means the Rutherford model is not good enough. If it's not good enough, we have to come up with something better. Okay? And those are the problems that we were facing with the Rutherford model that we need to move on to a better model. First one, moving electrons in orbit must continuously irradiate light and eventually lose energy. That would lead the electron to crash into the proton and that would collapse uh, the atom. The second issue uh, that was found was uh, about the, the spectral emission lines for hydrogen. So I'm showing them here. What are the spectral emission, emission lines? So if we have hydrogen inside glass, inside the glass at low pressure, and we apply a high, uh, potential a high electric potential here the hydrogen will emit light and the light is not a continuous emission it happens in very well defined uh, wavelengths so we have here the first emission is basically in the red then we have a second emission in the green a third emission in the blue 
and the fourth emission in uh, the violet, very close to the UV. How can we explain that hydrogen emits lines, emits very well-defined wavelengths, therefore very well-defined energy? We cannot explain that with a model that has a proton here and an electron moving around. So that cannot explain uh, those two things. And this first problem here, very, very uh, problematic. So let's move on and let's move on to a better model. And this better model is going to be the Bohr atomic model. So now let's dive into details in the Bohr atomic model. Okay, so let's see what Bohr uh, tells us. All right, so let's talk about the Bohr atomic model. Let me see one thing here, hold on. Okay, very good. Okay, so the first problem to solve is that uh, electrons moving around the nucleus will eventually lose energy and fall into the nucleus. So Bohr uh, solved this problem uh, with a very simple statement. What Bohr said is, okay, to solve this problem, I will postulate that there are some orbits that when the electron is in it, there is no loss in energy, okay? So there are some allowed orbits that the electron can freely move around the nucleus, and in those orbits, orbits there, are, there is no loss of energy. Very simple solution, right? Just postulate something and nobody can discuss that. If there is no loss in energy, that means there is an equilibrium between the electric force and the uh, centripetal forces, okay? So using the physics of the system that we are not going to discuss here, Bohr came up that those orbits, they have very well-defined radius. And we can actually calculate the radius of the allowed orbits where the electrons are not losing energy. And this is the equation that I'm showing you on the uh, low left corner here. I don't want you to memorize the equation. I want you to understand what the equation is telling us. First thing, this equation tells us that for specific radius, we have the allowed orbits that electrons do not lose energy, okay? So those are allowed orbits where electron is not losing energy when moving around the nucleus. 
the Bohr's equation for the radius, for the allowed radius, you have here a first set of constants, okay? So I'm showing you here what each constant means and the values. So this first portion here is a constant. So that will not change, will always be the same. And what I want you to look at is first n. This is going to be the number of the orbit, the number of the orbit is what we called shells, okay? Remember about the electron shells, so that's represented by n. And the second important thing here in the Bohr's equation is the z, or atomic number. Those are the two important things in this equation, okay? Number of the orbit, which is the number of the shell, and atomic number, Z. And that's where the concept of electron shells came from. It came from the Bohr atomic model. Each shell, it would be where the electron is allowed to move without losing energy. So if we, deep, if we dive deep in the physics here, we are going to find out that N must be an integer and different from zero, okay? So that's why we have shell number one, shell number two, shell number three, and so on. And we don't have a shell equals to zero or a shell equals to 1.5. It must be always an integer number an integer shell. So now let's think about the equation. What would happen with the radius of the orbit if we increase the number of the shell? If the number of the shell is increased, is directly proportional to the radius, that will increase the number of the radius, okay? So higher shells, for example, shells number two, three, and four, they will start to move far from the nucleus, while the shell number one is the closest to the nucleus, is the point that the, the electron can be closer to the nucleus without falling into the nucleus. So I have a question. Yes, sir. What happens if an electron collides with the nucleus? <laughs> so you would be uh, reacting a positive charge with a negative charge. So they are, they are opposites. So they would cancel each other and release a huge amount of energy. So you would have basically an explosion. Cool. <laughs> and uh, destroy everything, basically. So we cannot be there. <laughs> All right. Okay. So now that we know that the radius depends directly on the number of the orbit, and orbit, we are talking about shells, let's analyze what happens with the radius as a function of the atomic number. 
look at the equation. Always look at the equation. Remember that this whole first thing here is a constant, so that will never change. We are now keeping n constant and changing z, okay? So now that's the guy that's going to change. Oops. We are going to change z and see what happens uh, with the radius. If the atomic number increases, what's going to be the effect on the radius? They are inversely proportional, therefore the radius is going to decrease. Okay. Does that make physical sense? What do you think? So let's think about that. You don't need to answer me right now, and then we will analyze together. Why an increase in the atomic number causes a decrease in the radius? Okay, so let's analyze the problem. So we can see from the equation that an increase in the atomic number causes a decrease in the radius, but we have to think about the physics here. Does that make physical sense? Okay, the equation can tell you anything, but it needs to make physical sense. Okay, Z is what we call atomic number. Remember that the atomic number is equals to the number of protons, okay? And protons are the positive charge that's within the nucleus. For example, hydrogen has atomic number equals to one, therefore one proton. So I'm going to represent proton as a P plus. If we go down to the period, for example, potassium. Potassium has an atomic number equals to 19. Therefore, it has 19 protons, okay? 19 positive charges within the nucleus. So let's think here about hydrogen just one positive charge, okay? And that will produce an Rn. So it doesn't matter the value here. Now let's compare hydrogen with potassium. What happens when we have now, instead of one, we have 19 charges. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 19. Okay, so now we have 19 charges. What can we tell about the intensity that 19 charges attracts, attract one electron? Does it make sense that 19 positive charges will attract the electron with a higher intensity? Therefore, that's why there will be a decrease in the radius. 
and that's the meaning of the Bohr equation. So I don't want you to calculate anything using the equation, but you need to be able to understand the equation. What are the effects when we change the number of the shell and the atomic number? Okay, so uh, let me move on to the other screen. Okay, so if we need to calculate the radius, that's the equation. Remember that n is always an integer, and that's the number of the shell, of the electronic shell, shell number one, two, three, four, five, and etc. So our n here is going to be the radius of the n shell. For example, if n equals to one, that's going to be r1. If we are talking about the shell number two, n equals to two, therefore r2, n, etc., etc., etc. If we uh, input all the numbers for hydrogen, atomic number equals to one, we are going to get that R1 is 5.29 times 10 to the minus 11 meters. R2 is around 21 and R3 around 47 and so on. Okay. So as, as, as expected, when we increase the number of the shell, we are moving the electron uh, further from the nucleus. Okay, so for n equals to 1, radius is 5.29 times 10 to the minus 11 meters, and that's basically the size of a um, hydrogen atom. So pretty, pretty, pretty small. And one important thing that we get from the Bohr equation is that the radius for the first orbit can only be 5.9, 5.29 times 10 to the minus 11. The radius for the second one can only be 21.16 times 10 to the minus 11. So we have very well-defined values for the radius when we have very well-defined values and nothing in between is possible, we say that the radius is quantized, okay? So only allowed values are possible, nothing in between those. And that's why we have very well-defined shells, because the radius can have only one value. And that's something very important from the uh, Bohr atomic model. The radius for each shells are always an allowed value and nothing in between that. Okay, so now it's a good time to take a five minute break. We will come back at 11.46. Uh,
All right, so let's go back and let's uh, finish here the, the final stretch of this week's lecture. So we talked now for we talked about sorry, we talked about the radius, how to use the Bohr atomic model to uh, calculate the radius, and we saw that the radius de depends directly on the number of the shell n, and inversely on z atomic number, and that makes physical sense, right? More protons in the nucleus that will shrink. Uh, the atom and bring everybody uh, close together. Remember that what's defined by orbits in the Bohr atomic model, it's a postulated region where the electron does not lose energy when moving around the nucleus. So now that we talked about the radius, let's move on and let's talk about energy. Let me go back here to the PowerPoint. Okay. So that was the last thing I showed you. So now let's talk about energy. Again here, I'm not going to go step by step, but we can use uh, physics to get to the energy uh, using the Bohr atomic model. So what matters for us is to understand the equation. Now, energy is going to be directly proportional to the atomic number and inversely proportional to the number of the shell. So let's analyze that. And let me see here. Oops. Let's move to another screen. Then I can take notes. Okay, so again here, we have a bunch of numbers here that are a constant. And then what matters is Z and N. So let's see if uh, it makes some uh, physical sense here. As you move far from the nucleus, the energy will, uh, let's say, decrease, okay? So, and if we input the numbers for the hydrogen, again, we are going to get very, very well-defined uh, numbers for the energy and nothing in between those. So that means the energy of an atom is also quantized. The energy for the first orbit is minus 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18. For the second one goes to minus 0 0.54. And then for the third one goes uh, to uh, minus 0 0.24. With these values, we can also build an energy diagram for the hydrogen in this case here. So we are going to put energy in the y-axis and represents and represent one and equals to one, two and three by uh, horizontal lines. So let's think about that. Let's think which shell would be the most stable in the hydrogen atom. So just think, imagine that you are an electron and you are going to populate an atom. Would you rather be close to the nucleus or far from the nucleus? It seems like the strongest relationship uh, closer to the nucleus. Yes. Remember, electron is a negative charge and the nucleus is a positive charge. The coziest place in the atom is close to the nucleus because the attraction is going to be really, really, really strong. Therefore, when n equals to 1, that's the prime spot in the atom. That's the VIP sitting in the atom. That's the best place in the house and electrons will fight to be there. 
Therefore, if we represent this as an energy diagram, we also start populating n equals to 1 because it has the lowest energy possible. If n equals to 1 is already filled up, then we have to be uh, we have to be forced to move on to n equals to 2, and then after that, n equals to 3. That's why when you do electron configuration, you always start from the shell number 1, because it's the most stable place. When the shell number 1 is completely filled up, we have to move on to the shell number 2, and then after that, shell number three, four, five, and six, and seven. Okay, always start with the lowest energy possible. And see here again, n equals to one has a very well defined energy right here. And the next one, n equals to 2, has a very well-defined energy as well. And we cannot have anything in between those. Okay? So a very well-defined energy gap. Okay. Now that we know the correlation between radius and number of the shell and atomic number, and also the correlation between energy, the number of the shell and the atomic number, and that answers the questions of why we always start from shell number one and move up from that, because shell number one is the most stable place in the atom, and the other shells are what we call less stable. Always, always the most stable shell in an atom or in a molecule that receives an special, a special name called ground state. Okay, ground state is the lowest energy possible. And everything above that is called excited state. Okay, ground state, lowest energy possible, the most stable place, and everything above that is called excited state. Now let's start playing with the electron. Let's make the electron uncomfortable. So let's consider here, we are talking about hydrogen. Hydrogen is the most simple, the simplest element, Z equals to one, therefore one proton and one electron, okay? So that's where everything starts. If we just have one electron, there is no fight. So this electron is going to populate the shell number one, okay? It's going to live here in the most stable place of the atom, the shell number one, the closest to the nucleus, okay? the prime spot in the house. So this is you uh, in high school. You live, you use it to live with your parents. However, we know that's really tiring live living with uh, parents. So what do you do for college? Usually, you go as far as you can from your parents' house. So you move on to the excited state far from uh, the nucleus, far from a safe spot. 
And then you realize that, oh boy, the life in my parents' house was not that bad. So you tend eventually to go back or, or sometimes uh, you never uh, come back. So let's do the same thing here with the electron. And you can do the analogy with the energy diagrams that you saw uh, in thermochemistry. If I want to move from a low energy state to a high energy state, do I need to provide energy to the atom or not? So that would be the same thing as an endothermic transformation to move from a low energy state to a high energy state, we need to provide energy. Okay. We need to excite this electron. Once the electron is excited, it goes to a higher energy state. It's hard to live in a high energy state, the electron will go back from where it came from. When the electron goes back from where it came from, that's the same thing as an exothermic transformation. It will release energy. And the energy released has a very specific value of energy that depends on the delta E from the shells here, okay? So we can promote an electron to an excited state, providing energy to the electron. Once the electron is in the excited state, it will return to the ground state and on the way back releases energy. Here, depending on where the electron is coming from, the delta in energy is going to be different. And we can correlate energy with color of light. Okay. So depending on the value of energy, we are going to find a determined value for the frequency that will fall eventually in the visible. Okay. So this energy gap can be in the red, in the green, in the blue, or in the violet. That will depend on the correlation between energy and frequency. And that's what happens when we see fireworks. So the people that make uh, fireworks, they are very, very, very good chemists because they can change the composition of the firework and that will change the color. For example, sodium is yellow. Magnesium, that's going to provide a sort of a white light. Strontium, that's going to go in the red. Why when you change the atom or the element that's in the composition of the firework, you change the color that is emitted? Well, energy depends on the atomic number and the number of the shell. If we change the element, we change the atomic number, 
and that will change the structure or the energy of the electronic levels. For, oops. for example, for sodium, let's say we have this gap here. And for example, for strontium, we have a lower gap and that changes the energy of the emission reflecting on a change of the color emitted by the firework. And that's how you can use chemistry to manipulate the colors of each firework. Each element has a very characteristic color for the emission. And we can use that to identify elements as well. And that's the same thing that happens uh, when we can observe the northern lights. The northern lights are only observed in the extreme north pole of Earth. That's because in the north pole, we have a huge hole in the ozone layer. So that means we have high energy rays penetrating the earth in those regions. The air has a lot of nitrogen. Nitrogen has again a very characteristic set of energy levels. If we have very high energy rays hitting the nitrogen that will excite the electrons from the uh, core shells of the nitrogen to excited states. The electron cannot live in the excited state and will come back. On the way back, it will emit light. And in the case of nitrogen, the emission is very characteristic and it's going to be in the green region of the visible spectrum. And that's why the northern lights uh, are possible. And that's why they usually are green. When we have different colors, that will depend on the composition of the atmosphere. So remember that we can have also oxygen emitting and that will shift a little bit uh, the color emitted. And that's a way to explain the northern lights and why it is possible. Always remember that the energy has very well-defined levels, okay? very well-defined numbers. Nothing in between is possible. So the energy of the emission is going to be very characteristic for each element. Therefore, the consequences of the Bohr model are the electrons are moving in orbits around the nucleus. So we saw now that those orbits are very well specific uh, values where the electron does not lose energy. Because they are very well-defined values, we tell, we say that there is a quantization of the energy and radii. Now we can see that there is a relationship between orbit change and emission 
to explain the observed emission spectra of hydrogen. And Bohr got to a conclusion that maybe the classical mechanics that he used in his model might not be ideal to describe the atom. Okay. The Bohr model is very useful to introduce the concept of shells and explains why we have very characteristic lines of emission for the hydrogen. Okay. So what we are seeing when we have the lines emission is the specific transition between different electron shells. For example, in the red, in the green, in the blue, and then in the deep violet. Remember that there is a correlation between energy and the color. Okay? Red, low energy, and violet, high energy. Because there is no electron level in between the first two, that yields a line emission for the hydrogen. So the Bohr model is pretty good for the hydrogen. But once you move on from hydrogen, this model is a disaster. Okay? So that's the first problem of the Bohr model. Second problem is that the model started from a random postulate saying that in these orbits there is uh, no loss of energy. So that doesn't make any physical sense. And that's the second flaw of uh, the Bohr model. The second problem is that Bohr predicted very specific values for the trajectory of the electron. And we are going to see that that's a problem as well. So the Bohr model was very useful. However, had a lot of flaws. And it's interesting because when Bohr uh, got the Nobel Prize, his model was already uh, done and replaced by uh, something better. However, we have to recognize it was important to advance the knowledge. Professor, I have a question. Yes. When you get, you're talking about when you have different levels of energy and more energy is released, the more like high out levels when it comes back down, or is there ever get to a point when it releases energy like that's not just visible, like on the visible spectrum where it's like the ultraviolet or x-rays or anything like that? Absolutely, absolutely. And that will depend on uh, the structure of the atom, right? If the gap in energy is so high, so high that starts to fall in the UV, or even X-ray, that's totally possible. Okay, so with that, we finished the Bohr model and I think that's more than enough for today. So next week we will talk about uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and duality wave particle and realize that electron cannot be treated as a classic particle and we have to introduce some wave treatment and that will uh, guide us to the Schrodinger atomic model and that is the goal for uh, next week. So with that being said, uh, that's it for today, and I hope you have a good weekend. I will see you back on Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, George, can you hear me? I have a question real quick. Yes. Um, I was reading about um, carbon dating, and oh, I'm, yes. I'm just wondering if, uh, like, why is it that when there's cosmic rays, like subatomic particles, that knock into stuff in the upper atmosphere. Why does that turn into a uh, carbon 14 um, stuff? <laughs> yes, so that's uh, more related with when we start to investigate more the nucleus. Uh, 
So when you have high energy heating an atom, that may change the structure of the nucleus. So that will basically put the nucleus in a less stable situation. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one of the reasons uh, that you you were talking about, about carbon 14, uh, carbon 13 yeah. kind of thing. So and do we know what uh, cosmic rays are? Or is that just a total mystery? Uh, it's basically energy. <laughs> so uh, it's high energy, basically. So let me see. Well, I guess Earth is spinning pretty fast, so. Yes, the, co the, the, yes, the cosmic rays, they come from sun. OK. So it's, result, it's a result of the, the explosions in the sun. And that releases the cosmic rays. Cool, thank you. OK.